I'm Dan kurtz and this is the Foreign Affairs Interview. Overall, my feeling was that things had really changed a lot, not for the better, and that China was heading down essentially a dead-end path. In March 2020, as COVID-19 spread across the globe, the Chinese government expelled a handful of American journalists from China. Among them was Ian Johnson, who'd been living there for 20 years. This spring, Johnson finally returned to China. While he was there, he spoke to a cross-section of Chinese people, scholars and officials, but also small business owners and bus drivers and students and nuns, people he'd in many cases known for years. What he found was grim, a country in a state of stagnation, a turning inward. Its leader, Xi Jinping, seemed so intent on control and so obsessed with security that no price was too high. Yet, under the surface, there may be more dissent than most observers realize. Ian, thanks for joining me and for the essay that you wrote in our current issue. It's called Xi's Age of Stagnation, and it's really a uniquely illuminating mix of both kind of humane reportage and incisive analysis. So thank you for that. Well, thank you. It was really great to write the essay, and your crack editing team did wonders with my prose. Well, it, it, it did not need a lot of work, but glad to hear that. You know, the prompt for the essay, of course, is your return to this place where you lived, this country where you lived for 20 years, but left early in the months of the pandemic. Most of your time living in China, you know, until the last few years seemed to be a time of kind of gradual opening and optimism economically and culturally, you know, a time when the U.S.-China relationship seemed to be improving rather than rapidly deteriorating as it is now. But that, of course, it started to shift in the years before you left. And yet you still were surprised by what you found when you returned to China after a few years away. Just talk a bit about what that experience was like, what, what had changed, what surprised you. I had, I had different feelings. I left in early 2020, in March of 2020, as part of these tit-for-tat journalistic expulsions. The Trump administration had expelled 58 Chinese journalists, and the Chinese retaliated by expelling about 15 American journalists. At the time, I was accredited for the New York Times. And so I left, and I was actually out of the country when I was expelled. I didn't even have a chance to pack up my apartment or say goodbye to people. So it was a bit of a weird departure. It wasn't a typical departure that one has when one's been in a place for a long time where you have some farewell dinners and make a walk around the Forbidden City or someplace like that. So I going back was also a chance to sort of close that chapter in my life, but it was also a chance to evaluate how things had changed after the COVID period, after the COVID lockdowns and the, the radical policies that the government had followed to control the virus. And it was also a chance for me to sort of see China in a new light because when I I was there continuously, of course, I went on vacations and stuff, but from January 1st of 2009 until March 2020, so it was a bit like being a frog in a pot of water boiled and you sort of get it's getting hotter and hotter but it's only when you jump out of it and then you go back in you realize gosh you know things really are different and so some of my feelings were based on that and some of it were things that I think had actually changed in the intervening three years from 2020 to 2023 and overall my feeling was that things had really changed a lot not for the better and that China was heading down essentially a dead-end path. So to talk a bit more about the diagnosis, and you, we call this stagnation in the title of the piece, but that's a modification of a Chinese concept that you translate as involution. And just to quote what I thought was a really powerful line from the piece, when you're talking about economic problems in China, you note that these are, quote, part of a broader process of political ossification and ideological hardening. For anyone who's observed the country closely over the past few decades, it is difficult to miss the signs of a new national stasis. So talk more about what brought you to that conclusion and what you think this means for China. Well, going away and then returning gave me a chance to take things from a slightly broader perspective than perhaps is the case when you're living in a place. And my overall feeling is if you think back to why Xi Jinping came to power, he was part of this turn by the party toward more control. We tend to see it all 
due to Xi Jinping when he took power in 2012. But in fact, the signs were already there beforehand. Susan Shirk has talked about that in her new book, Overreach. And at the time, there were signs, unmistakable signs. Social media was being closed down. Some NGOs were coming under pressure. And Xi Jinping really supercharged this. And I think his mandate was to reassert party control over a variety of things, including civil society, ideology, and the economy. And he's gone about that in a ruthless fashion, perhaps much more so than his supporters might have wished, because he's almost turned his back on most of the policies, arguably, that made China such a success story for the first 30 years of the reform period. And those, that might be defined as 1978, roughly, until the end of the 2000s, around, the, around 2010 or something like that. And during this period, that was characterized by a lighter touch on society. Obviously, huge caveats here, Tiananmen Square, crackdown on Falun Gong, those were brutal actions. But overall, a lighter touch on people's personal lives, their daily life, and a lighter touch on the economy and a, a tolerance, even a, a support, a broad support for private enterprise. And I think he's radically changed that formula of success. He's abandoned it, left it. And that's, I think, leading to these problems. Let's talk a bit about the economy because that's been such a focus of analyses of China from the outside over the last several months. The you know story was that we anticipated was that when China ended zero COVID as it did late last year, the economy would come roaring back. And instead, what we've seen is continued tepid growth and high youth unemployment and lots of signs that things are rot beneath the surface, even beyond what we can see. There was always a sense that that would present a kind of acute challenge to the party and that leadership needed to maintain high economic growth to maintain their own legitimacy to kind of sell this bargain to the Chinese people. That no longer seems to be the case. They just don't seem especially concerned by what looks like a fairly dramatic slowdown. Is that your sense as well? I think what the party is telling itself is that this is part of a transition that we're making away from making cheap stuff and and growth based on investment toward a high-tech economy that will pull us up into the ranks of the advanced nations, the rich nations. Because don't forget, even though China is an economic superpower and a military superpower, economically per capita, it's still a mid-income country. And that the government thinks this is part of a necessary transition that we have to embark on is going to be painful, but we're going to do things the right way. We're not going to just blindly invest in real estate and other fixed asset investments like more high-speed rail. But we're going to change the formula for growth. Unfortunately, I don't think they're going about this in a way that is really going to lead to success. It's certainly not what most Chinese economists and foreign economists, for that matter, recommend or see as viable. The idea essentially that the government is going to push high tech, pick the winners, pick the sectors, that can sometimes work when you're playing catch up to other countries, when you already see who's doing what successfully, and then you say, okay, we're going to invest in those sectors. But when you're trying to become a leading nation, then it's harder to essentially copy what others are doing. So I, I think this is the conundrum that they face. They're trying this model, but it doesn't seem likely to succeed. One of the things that comes through so clearly in the, the piece you wrote for us, but I think is true of your reporting more broadly, is that you connect with a much broader swath of people in China and, uh, and go to a wider range of places in China than the standard Western analyst who might drop in for a week or two and talk to, to mostly other elites. In that reporting that you were doing for this piece and more broadly, did you sense discontent, any kind of questions about the leadership of the party or of Xi Jinping? A lot of it depends on who the person's employer is. There's still many Chinese people who work for the state, who work as civil servants, who work for state-owned enterprises. And for them, things aren't that bad. They're still getting their paychecks. The government is supporting them, so they probably are even benefiting from the change in policy and they may like Xi Jinping's foreign policy being more muscular. They may have a sort of more nationalistic bent and find that good. So those people are probably doing okay and are probably thinking the government is on the right track. People who depend on the private economy, who have anything to do with foreign investment, foreign companies, but even Chinese entrepreneurs themselves who are private, they're feeling the pinch and they are not that happy. So 
this isn't necessarily even just the elites who are running companies. People who are working for them notice that there are fewer foreigners. The tourism industry hurts to some degree because of that. They can sense that there's been a change and that it isn't all for the better. To what extent did people still talk about the experience of zero COVID and especially the end of zero COVID? The lockdowns in China, of course, lasted much longer than elsewhere and were, were much more uh, draconian. That worked well for a while until it didn't. And then the party lifted those very, very abruptly with little preparation. That seemed kind of staggering to watch from the outside at the time. But I'm curious to what extent, you know, several months later, that still seemed to have kind of left a scar on the population, but also sown questions in people's mind about the wisdom of their own government. Definitely the zero COVID policy and the abandonment of it in such a dramatic fashion, almost a reckless fashion, was the first crisis that many people experienced in their lifetimes. Or this is true, especially for young people, say people who are in their 20s now, they've probably only known pretty good times if they, even in their 30s, they've only seen growth continuing. This was a shock, I think, for a lot of people that the government so obviously mishandled things. Early on, you could say it was harsh, but it was successful. And compared to the debacle in many foreign countries with millions of people dead and so on and so forth, it wasn't too bad. So in 2020, it made a lot of sense, zero COVID, the draconian lockdowns, at least millions of people weren't dying in China as they were in other countries. But by the second half of 2021, this really didn't make much sense anymore with better vaccines. And people began to sense this, to realize it, that, hey, other countries are doing it better. Other countries are opening up. Why aren't we opening up? And 2022 was really the worst year for Xi Jinping, probably since he took power in 2012. The lockdowns were failures, they, at least on a popular level. They led to huge silent protests or protests in different ways. And then the abandonment of zero COVID led to more than a million deaths of preventable deaths, which shocked people. I, mean, I talked to a doctor who worked in an emergency ward in a county hospital where the medical system is really not that good. And he was sh shocked at the number of people who were coming in and who were dying in the ward. And he said, we thought this was what we were supposed to be avoiding. Uh, this is what the government said only happened in the Western countries, but here it was happening now. We didn't have a new round of vaccines for old people. We didn't even lay in antiviral medicines, which we could have done, but we didn't. It was all overnight. Even for us, we had no chance to prepare. So he was really embittered by that experience. That was, that was in May. Now, of course, as time passes, these memories will grow fainter. But I think it was this year, it's still very much in people's minds. The protests that, at least from, from the outside, seemed to prompt the end of zero COVID were, I think, fairly shocking at the time from people watching from the outside to see fairly open protests that included kind of open defiance of the party in a number of Chinese cities. But it does not seem to have, you know, led to a sustained wave that at least we can see. What do you think we should make of it? And what do you think the takeaways for Xi Jinping and for the party more generally are? It is sometimes easy to overestimate events that we see on the street. If you count all the protesters together, they probably numbered at the most just a few thousand. But I think that it was still extraordinary that people felt the need to protest, that this level of frustration was just so palpable and it's just so overwhelming that people took this highly unusual step. Don't forget, China is not the kind of place nowadays, at least under Xi Jinping, where there are regular street protests like this that challenge central government policies. So I think it was quite significant. I'm not sure if it directly led to the COVID policies being overturned. I think that was also due in part to the huge financial cost of zero COVID that the local governments had to spend huge amounts of money on setting up these COVID testing stations. It really kneecapped the economy. And this is one of the reasons why the economy has continued to be so slow. But the significance of it could be that rather than being an outlier, a one-off, that as the economy continues to slow and China is faced with more longer-term challenges, such as demographic challenges, that this could be a harbinger of protests and unrest in the future. Because pretty much everyone agrees that the days of fast economic growth are past in China. Part of that is normal because as an economy matures, it can't grow as quickly. But 
that kind of a strong, robust economic growth also papered over a lot of cracks in Chinese society. Without that growth, it's going to be harder for the government to sort of keep a lid on things as they have so successfully over the past few decades. One thing that you note in the essay is the level of youth unemployment. And I was, I was in China in, uh, in July and you know, struck by conversations I had with people at universities who said that graduates wanted to extend the time in, their time in school rather than entering such a terrible job market. To what extent do you think that's a source of dissatisfaction that may be significant going forward? That's a really major change for kind of elite students coming out of universities. It's sort of striking that in a country that is facing this demographic challenge, where the population is shrinking, the number of young people is declining every year, that there's problems in finding jobs for people. That, I think, has to be considered a huge failing in Xi Jinping's economic policies. And it's not something that just came up because of zero COVID. This is the explanation that you hear from sort of pro-government or people who, who repeat the government line. They'll say, well, zero COVID was perhaps a little bit excessive. It did kind of hurt the economy, but give us a year or two and things will be back to normal. Rather, I think the slowdown is due to over a decade of not only a lack of pro-market reforms, but a series of anti-market reforms that have slowed the poles of growth that have been so important for China over the past 30 or 40 years. We'll be back after a short break. The story of the global economy is one we all write. And this October, it's time for the next chapter. Leaders from 190 countries are gathering in Marrakesh to discuss how to build a better future, greener, fairer, together. Join us in a timeless city with a new story to tell for the 2023 World Bank Group IMF Annual Meetings, October 9th to the 15th. Find out more at meetings.imf.org. The essay is, of course, fascinating in its own right, but it's also particularly fascinating read alongside your new book called uh, Sparks, which is about what you call the counter historians in China, which suggests there are these kinds of strands of independent thought that may be kind of hard to identify and connect with for most observers from the outside. Talk about who these counter historians are and why you saw that as uh, such a significant dimension of modern China's experience that was worth you know, writing a book about. Yeah, I call them counter historians or underground historians as a shorthand for a group of people who you could also call public intellectuals, writers, filmmakers, artists, novelists, journalists, and others who are trying to chronicle the whitewashed portions of Chinese history, the, the portions of history that the Communist Party does not really want people to know about because it's, as we were talking about, it legitimizes itself partially on performance. Um, but it also legitimizes itself based on this historical argument, which is linked to performance. That is that history brought the party to power in 1949, and its string of successes since then shows that the party deserves to stay in power going forward. And that's why you can't really have an open discussion about the many traumas that have taken place over the past 75 years, not just things from the last century like the Great Famine or the Cultural Revolution, but things like zero COVID. And the people I write about are active in, in all of these spheres. They also tried to chronicle what happened in Wuhan, how that outbreak took place. And these are also things that the government, this narrative it wants to control particularly strong. It was interesting also for me to see that the people I wrote about a couple of them came to the fore in the zero COVID protests last year as people got frustrated and they thought the government's version of reality, the story they've been telling us is not working. It's obviously not accurate. They began to look for alternative voices, alternative ways of explaining China's past. And some of the people I wrote about were then circulated in social media and had a bit of a platform. To the extent that there is a, I realize there's a great diversity of, of thought among the people that you, you write about in the book, but is there an alternate vision for China's future, for its future leadership, for governance in China? To what extent is it, do you see the kind of incipient uh, alternate path for the country in the work of this group? Yeah, the subtitle is China's Underground Histories and Their Battle for the Future. So you begin to wonder, well, what is their agenda? They don't have a definite plan like, say, classic dissidents might who have a, a charter or some sort of a, a 
program to replace one-party rule with multi-party rule or something like that. Rather, I think they would like to push for a more open China. There's a huge variety of visions that people have, somehow very concrete political ideals and ideas they'd like to push. Others just want to have a more tolerant government, one where the past can be discussed freely. And they do realize, of course, that by doing this, they challenge the Communist Party's legitimacy. But it's not so much a push to overthrow the CCP or something like that. It's just, let's try to get this knowledge out there and help people understand that there's more to the Communist Party than what they read in their textbooks or see in museum exhibitions or on popular TV dramas. And to what extent are these people tolerated? I mean, these are not, for the most part, dissidents, as you say, who have been forced to, to flee China or have been in prison. There's kind of a, a more complicated dynamic between them and the government and the party. Yes, these people have one foot inside the system and one foot outside. A couple of them might be considered classic dissidents. But for example, Professor I, she's retired from the university, but held a position at the university as a tenured professor. There's another journalist I wrote about, uh, Mr. Tan, and he worked for a government-run magazine. Professor Guo at Tsinghua University in Beijing also works in the sociology department there. So they do sort of normal things that normal people do, right? They own property and they raise family. They just try to do other things, travel and go on vacations and stuff like that. They're not sort of holed up in a garret with a crazy plan to overthrow the party, as sometimes one might think of dissidents being, you know, lone wolves or people tilting at windmills. But I think all of them have paid a price and they have been marginalized People such as Professor I have suffered for it. Uh, the, the journalist, Mr. Tan, Tan, he was never given a promotion, never allowed to do anything else, just kept it. He kept his job, but he was sort of shuffled off into the corner. And in some ways, the government does this as a way to keep an eye on you and to keep another bit of pressure that they can use on you by saying, we know where you are, at least. We know where you live. You're not completely off our radar screen this way. But the government increasingly does not like what they do, especially through the 2010s after Xi Jinping took power. Their venues for expressing themselves have been shut down. I want to shift the conversation a bit to some of the ways that this analysis intersects with the uh, questions for, for U.S. policy and the U.S.-China relationship. I think one thing that, that I was struck by in conversations you know, with a much narrower range of scholars when, when I was in China over the summer was how much more they think that a kind of nationalist public hems them in, that when they write something that is you know, not sufficiently hardline, it's not just you know, the occasional party authority that responds to them, but also a outpouring of anger from the kind of nationalist online crowd, and that that has really changed. Do you, do you think that the, that kind of level of nationalism is in fact a major factor, or is that kind of ginned up by the party to reinforce their own hardline message? It's true that when you go on social media in China, you find a lot of nationalists talking, but this is also because other voices have been silenced. So in some ways, if the government were a bit more tolerant, then you would have some people challenging the nationalist narrative and offering up other visions. It's not that there aren't nationalists in China, and if there were free and democratic elections in China, it's quite possible that there would be an ultra-nationalist party that could come to power. However, we won't really know at all until there is a bit more of a public discussion in China that's permitted. And yet the government does not want this at all. I was struck by more or less a consensus among everyone I spoke to that when I asked them to characterize U.S. policy towards China at this point, it was some version of, you know, Washington is out to, to weaken China, to suppress China's rise, to undercut its power. Was that Similar to what you heard, did you hear more complicated views of U.S. policy in the United States, or was that a shift in the you know few years you were out of China? No, that is the view, certainly, that many people have in China. However, my overall feeling going back, again, sort of taking the very macro view, is that China is doing more to isolate itself than the West is doing to isolate China. In some specific areas, such as technology, the United States policy now and other Western countries' policies is essentially doing what China has always done to Western countries. I mean, you could never take, cut if there was cutting edge Chinese technology, you'd never be able to 
to to get access to it. Now we're simply saying you can't have access to our cutting edge technology, but that's not really that surprising that a, a country would take that. Countries like the United States would take those actions, I think. Rather, what struck me was just how China is not really interested in reopening to the outside world on a vast array of things like people to people, contacts. They don't really care about tourists coming back, foreign students coming back. I think in some ways the COVID crisis plays perfectly into the overall efforts by the government to limit foreign contacts because they can just blame it a little bit on COVID and then sort of reset the clock. They are quite happy to to have a, a not an isolated country. It's certainly not like, say, North Korea or anything like that. But it's it's no longer the country that welcomes foreign investors or, or foreigners really at all to go there and do stuff, unless you happen to be bringing technology or doing something completely innocuous. Yeah, I, mean, I, was, I was really struck by something you noted in the, in the piece, which is just how hard it is to be a foreign visitor at this point in, in very kind of quotidian ways that you, you know, no one takes cash anymore. You have to have, you know, a Chinese credit card and the right kind of apps to just kind of exist day to day, even in Beijing, which was certainly a change from, you know, the last time I was there before the pandemic. Yeah, going back there, I felt that it was somehow amazing in some ways how China has created this parallel universe of apps. Some of it is almost this Rube Goldberg sort of ramshackles apps and stuff like that. They don't really work as well. Going back and using all the, the Chinese maps, mapping systems and this, that, social media, the their version of Wikipedia and so on and so forth. It's all, and this is very subjective, but it's, it's kind of second rate. And there are some things that, that work pretty well, like WeChat and so on. But the overall idea I think that a lot of people have with social media or at least with the internet as a broad concept is that it helps link us with other people, that we can have conversations with people around the world, et cetera, more easily. We can connect, we can use translation software to try to understand what other people are doing. But in China, it's almost the opposite. It's like all of this stuff is being formed to isolate Chinese from the rest of the world, to make it harder and harder to interact. Did you sense a change in views of the United States in, in your conversations, not so much of U.S. policy, but of, of U.S. power, let's say? I mean, the kind of one of the staples of Xi Jinping's rhetoric, certainly, was this idea that, um, you know, the, the, the East is rising, the West is declining, the sense that as China's power was growing, the West was in terminal decline. That's much, I think, harder to make that case right now. But had that changed the view among a broader array of Chinese voices? What, what, what was the sense of, of the United States? Overall, the feeling I got, even from people at the grassroots and working class neighborhoods and, and, and places like that, was that it was harder to be an American, to say you're an American. Of course, old friends and stuff like that, they don't care. But you would sometimes get people make some kind of a, a nervous joke about, oh, you're from the United States, the world's policeman, right? Something like that. And you're kind of, everyone goes, ha, 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 ha right? So, yeah, the world's policeman, ha, ha, ha. And then, well, what about old Biden and stuff like that? You get this kind of, this, this, this overall feeling that you're coming from an enemy country. And although Chinese are extremely hospitable and there's no personal animosity at all, that it was somehow more awkward than it was before. You'd have to be sort of get a really contrarian person who would say, oh, great, the United States, I really admire the United States, or I'm really interested in going there to travel. You got a lot more of that 20 years ago, 30 years ago, when I went to China early on. But nowadays, it's more of a sort of a bit of a nervous recognition that you're from the other side. So there's this idea that has become quite prominent in American analyses of China, which, you know, the shorthand is peak China, this idea that China's power has peaked, its growth is not just softened, but is, is going to kind of go into decline. Your essay, in some ways, could be seen feeding into that. But I think you kind of come out in a very different place. And you have this, I think, very powerful comparison to the, to the Berlin Wall. And you note, I'm quoting you here, the wall couldn't save the German Democratic Republic, but it bought the leadership time. Now China's rulers seem to be building and perfecting their own 21st century version of the Berlin Wall. Talk a bit about what you think that means in terms of what the next years look like for China. I think there's maybe two things one has to keep in mind when embarking on a very pessimistic analysis of China. One is that China is still run by a very competent civil service 
and has a population that is hardworking and, and reveres education. You also have to think that some of what the government is doing may not be very productive in the long run, but it's still going to keep China in the game. And I think if you're worried about China from a military point of view, let's say, these things that are happening in China right now don't affect that equation. If you're worried about peace in the Taiwan Straits, if China doesn't grow quite as strongly as it might, it doesn't mean it won't stop building aircraft carriers and modernizing its military. It will still afford that. I, I do think, though, that what you see probably is a country that's more and more hobbled by the decisions it's making. That again, when you have this supercharged economic growth, you can afford a lot of different things. When you have slower growth, problems begin to be harder to master by simply having fast economic growth. And that goes back to these counter historians that they are probably going to get more of a hearing and be more relevant as the country continues down this road of slower growth and with more social problems percolating up. So it's a period probably, people often say, was it like the Soviet Union? Uh, often when they hear this, about these counter historians, they say it's like the Soviet Union in the 1980s, the rise of groups like Memorial, which helped undermine the Soviet Union. I would say it's more like 1960s Soviet Union, when Brezhnev is still sort of at his peak and strong and hasn't yet declined. And we still have a long way to go before there's going to be any systemic crisis or change in the overall rule of China or the system that runs it. There's another idea that I think gets pretty wide purchase in, in Washington, which is that a China that is struggling more on the home front that doesn't have, you know, kind of miraculous economic growth to make problems go away is more likely to lash out internationally or to take risks you know, in, in its own region or, or, or globally. I think even President Biden has said this at various points. Does that strike you as, as, as the right way of thinking about it? I think the bigger risk is that there are many, many signs that Xi Jinping seems to be isolated. There are strange political events over the past few months, the foreign minister disappearing, the defense minister disappearing, the COVID policies, which seem to be the result of somebody who's not really listening to his advisor's the economic policies, which also seem to be running against what used to be fairly conventional wisdom in China on the need for some element of a robust private sector. So I think that he could embark on some sort of foreign adventures in, in a way similar to Putin, because he thinks, I can win this, or it, it will work in my favor, if he's being told that. I don't know how many advisors now will dare to tell him things that he doesn't want to hear. This is especially true after the past, the last party Congress last year, when the people of his generation all retired, that left him there, surrounded by people who are basically 20 years his junior, who probably are only in these positions because he approved their promotion and so owes something to him. So they're even less likely to say, hey, you know what, this is not a good idea. We need to back off on private enterprise or let's just put Taiwan in the back burner for another 10 years until we're in a better position. We don't know what kind of advice he'll get, but I think that it could be that he gets bad advice. And that seems to me the most likely scenario for some sort of foreign misadventure. I want to close by um, getting your views on some of the, the questions for US policymakers um, informed by the, you know, I think much more textured, richer sense of dynamics on the ground um, that you have that many people lack. Uh, you came back to the United States a year or two ago, I believe. It, it has only been a couple of years. And you probably could have written a completely different essay uh, upon your return about the dramatic shift in debate about China here. So I'm curious what struck you about the dynamics of that debate and especially what, what it gets wrong, what you think as you observe the debate about China and U.S. foreign policy circles, what um, you know, m makes you kind of scratch your head or causes concern on your part? Many of the policies make a lot of sense to me, such as not wanting to sell our best technology to China. I don't really buy into the sort of fatalist, laissez-faire view that they're going to get it anyway. I think if they want to get it, then they should try to have to get it themselves. We don't have to give them our best stuff. So some of that I, I support. What I miss is a a vision for how to actually live with China in the future. There doesn't seem to be any effort at restarting interest um, in academia, 
for China, we need some sort of almost like a Marshall Plan to kickstart universities to send students back to China. We need to improve Chinese studies. Right now, Chinese studies is cratering. The number of people studying Chinese is going way down. There's more interest in Japan because of manga comics or in Korea because of K-pop. I mean, seriously, this is what motivates young people, right? This is what gets you excited when you're an 18 or 19-year-old picking your major. It's not because China might be the next superpower or something. That's not going to get somebody to choose Chinese studies. We need to somehow make the case that China matters and this is where maybe I, I in my the end of my book, I, I have a bit of a challenge for civil society in the United States. I think we need to engage more with these really interesting people in China and invite them over to our film festivals, hold retrospectives about them, bring them over to our think tanks, get their books translated more often. There's so few of these books are translated. They're journalistic essays and so on and have a project to sort of understand people who have another vision for China. I think sometimes we take the front page of People's Daily as the gospel truth. And the front page of People's Daily is that Xi Jinping is in charge and he's doing everything he wants and he's got complete and absolute control of the country. When you get there and look around a little bit, you see, that's not exactly the case. And so we need to understand that there are other people with other ideas and then try to give them a platform in a way that they don't really have now. And in some ways, we had it in the Cold War. I don't know exactly why that was, if it was all the CIA funding secret translation projects of things, but there seemed to be a lot more novels and, and essays and stuff by Central and Eastern European intellectuals. Some of them were household names among educated people in the West. You don't find that among Chinese today, but those people do exist. And if you bring those kind of people over, I think you also have this synergy to firing up interest in China. You would have people who see, hey, there are interesting people in China doing amazing work. And it's a big mistake, I think, just to sort of write off China and say, nothing's going on there. It's just a totalitarian dictatorship. Forget it. Let's just sort of bar the door and keep them out. That's not going to deal with the reality we faced in the rest of the 21st century. That's a really good note to end on. Ian, thank you for joining me today. And thanks so much for the really wonderful essay on the issue called She's Age of Stagnation. Thanks so much. My pleasure. Thank you for listening. You can find the articles that we discussed on today's show at foreignaffairs.com. The Foreign Affairs interview is produced by Kate Brannon, Julia Fleming Dresser, and Molly McEnany. Special thanks also to Grace Finlayson, Caitlin Joseph, Nora Revenaugh, Asher Ross, Gabrielle Sierra, and Marcus Zacharia. Our theme music was written and performed by Robin Hilton. Make sure you subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you like what you heard, please take a minute to rate and review it. We release a new show every other Thursday. Thanks again for tuning in. Thanks again for tuning in.